Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Um, thank you for joining tonight. We have two really great cases, and um, I hope that everyone can participate in the attendee chat. My name is Edith Schussler. I'll be moderating the questions. Um, as a reminder, before we get started, this will be our last webinar before we go on our summer break. If you have any cases that you want to present, you can email the CIS office and you may be scheduled when the webinars start up again in September. In the meantime, um, during the presentations, if you put your questions or comments in the attendee chat, I will be um, watching the comments and then we will be presenting them to the presenters. So um, let's get started with Abir Siddiqui from Columbia University. Um, her senior mentor is Rebecca Marsh and she will be presenting a case of two brothers. Good evening, everybody. I'm Abir Siddiqui. I'm a current first year allergy immunology fellow at Columbia. And I want to thank CIS for giving me this opportunity to present an interesting case that was seen at our affiliate site at Wild Cornell and co-jointly managed at our institution at the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital. My faculty mentors for this case are Dr. Perdita Permal and Dr. Ramsey Fullahan, and my senior mentor is Dr. Rebecca Marsh from Cincinnati Children's. So this is a 16-year-old male from Dominican Republic who recently moved to the United States in August of 2020. His medical history is significant for IBD manifestations, which symptoms started since three months of age, diagnosed with colonoscopy with biopsy at eight years of age. Celiac disease, diagnosed on colonoscopy with biopsy, currently on a gluten-free diet. Recurrent pneumonias, complicated by bilateral pneumothoraces. Pleural effusions with chest tube placement in June of 2020. Left metatarsal osteomyelitis in 2011. And recurrent episodes of dengue fever. Chronic steroid use leading to iatrogenic adrenal insufficiency, who presented to established care at the New York Presbyterian Queens. He reported experiencing episodes of fever, abdominal pain, blood pinched diarrhea for multiple days with decreased appetite. He had completed multiple courses of metronidazole and ciprofloxacin with no improvement in symptoms. This is his timeline of his gastrointestinal symptoms, which initially started in the Dominican Republic. In 2004, when he was three months of age, he started developing loose, watery, non bloody diarrhea. Workup revealed iron deficiency anemia with a normal hemoglobin electrophoresis and normal stool studies, including ova and parasites. In 2005, at the age of one year, he developed cervical lymphadenopathy and hepatosplenomegaly on CT imaging, which re and revealed um, an ongoing anemia with thrombocytopenia. He was also noted to be CMV IgM and IgG positive and HSV IgM positive. In 2007, at the age of two years, his diarrhea persisted. His initial EGD with biopsy and histology showed chronic gastritis. In 2011, at age of seven years, he had continued diarrhea with an unintentional 15 pound weight loss. In 2012, at the age of eight years, he had his initial colonoscopy with biopsy, which revealed celiac disease and ulcerative colitis. Workup for the anti gliadin antibody was elevated. He was treated with mesalamine and a gluten-free and a tropical fruit-free diet. For a period of six years from 2012 to 2018, he improved on the therapy. In 2018, when he was 14 years of age, he developed high fever with worsening bloody diarrhea. Workup revealed high fecal calprotectin. Stool studies for DNA PCR were positive for entamoeba histolytica specific antigen. Repeat endoscopy and colonoscopy showed features of active ulcerative colitis, tropical sprue, erosive gastropathy, chronic deutonitis with a negative H. pylori testing. In 2019, at the age of 15 years, he had multiple inpatient evaluations. He was noted to have chronic splenomegaly on ultrasound. An MRI of the abdomen was done, which showed IBD with compromise of the ileocecal valve. In June of 2020, at the age of 16 years, he moved to the United States and established care at New York Presbyterian Queens. 
In September of 2020, he had a repeat EGD with colonoscopy, which showed friable gastritis, pancolitis, which was worse in the rectosigmoid region, and ulceration, which was noted throughout, including terminal ileum, suspicious for Crohn's disease. Treatment with infliximab was initiated, and he received two induction doses of 10 milligrams per kilogram, and his symptoms improved. Two months later, he had breakthrough symptoms. He was readmitted. Um, infliximab level was undetectable. He had borderline antibodies. He was transitioned to IV steroids and infliximab with immediate improvement in symptoms. He was also started on quadruple antibiotic therapy with oral amoxicillin, ciprofloxacin, metronidazole, and oral vancomycin, and NG tubes were initiated at this time. He was continued on treatment with infliximab Q2 weeks. In December of 2020, he was noted to be CMV IgM positive with a CMV PCR less than 96 copies per ml, and treatment with valg gansiclover was initiated. Two months later, um, valg gansiclover was discontinued as a CMV PCR was undetectable, and the EBV PCR at that time was less than 49 copies per ml. He had a repeat EGD and colonoscopy, which now showed a normal esophagus, duodenum, chronic exudative gastritis with minimally active ileitis and mild active colitis. In terms of its complex past medical, um, past surgical and infectious history, in 2007, at the age of three years, he developed right unilateral submandibular lymphadenopathy attributed to a viral syndrome. Biopsy at that time was inconclusive. In 2009, at the age of five years, he was diagnosed with a right middle lobe pneumonia and bilateral maxillary sinusitis confirmed on CT imaging, treat, treated with an extensive course of IV and oral antibiotics. Um, in, over the period of two years from 2009 to 2011, he had multiple episodes of pneumonias requiring IV antibiotics and also recurrent episodes of dengue fever. In 2011, at seven years, he had developed an osteomyelitis and was treated with left foot surgery. In 2018, at the age of 14 years, he had an end and to be by histolytica infection, which was chronic infection for two years. In 2019, at the age of 15 years, he had a group B strep um, lower urinary tract infection, which was treated with antibiotics. And in June of 2020, at the age of 16 years, he had a pneumonia complicated with bilateral pneumothoraces and pericarditis, status post bilateral chest tube placement, which required a one month long ICU stay in the DR. He also had an IBD flare at that time that required a central line placement for TPN, was complicated by a Klebsiella pneumonia class B infection. In terms of his birth history, he was born at 41 weeks gestational age via C-section to an uncomplicated pregnancy. Um, in terms of his family history, as you can see in the pedigree is notable for a maternal uncle diagnosed with Crohn's disease at a young age and subsequently had 80% of his gut resected. He has a brother with seasonal allergies, shellfish allergy, asthma, prior EBV infection with elevated titers, and who was admitted multiple times in the Dominican Republic for pneumonia. He has a sister who's otherwise healthy um, and a maternal grandfather with diabetes and hypertension. In terms of his immunizations, when he came to the United States, he was immunized with Tdap, meningococcal, Gardasil, hepatitis A, varicella, and MMR. This is his growth curve. When he had initially presented to us, he was below the third percentile for weight. With treatment, he regained his weight to almost 50th percentile before dropping off to 25th percentile with a recent IBD flare. In terms of his initial workup, his hemoglobin was 11 with hematocrit of 33.4 and MCV of 88. His total protein was low at 5.4 with an albumin of 3.7, globulin of 1.7. His ALT was, mildly, was elevated to 213 and an ALK-FOS was low at 44. His CXCL9 was elevated at 1,834. In terms of his flow cytometry, his CD4s were low at 474, 24%. CD8s were elevated at 1,311, 68%, B-cells of 107, 5%, and normal NK cells. His IgG was elevated to greater than 2,000. IgM and IgA were also elevated, 292 and 475. 
in terms of its antibody screen was pretty much negative, except for thyroglobulin antibody was slightly elevated at six. His ANA was negative. His CMV, IgG, CMV, IgM, HSV1, 2, IgG, HSV1, IgM were positive. His HIV was non-reactive. His measles, um, IgG was negative, but he was immune um, with appropriate titer for mumps, rubella, and varicella. His EBV um, viral capsid antigen IgM was negative, but IgG um, was 105. His EBNA IgG was 149. His EBV DNA PCR was less than 200 copy per ml, and a CMV PCR was also negative. In terms of his imaging, he had an MRI abdomen with and without IV contrast, which showed a long segment of mucosal thickening with enhancement involving the distal descending colon and the entirety of the sigmoid colon. His liver and his spleen were also noted to be mildly enlarged. So what would be the differential diagnosis at this point in time? So we have a couple of, or a few thoughts coming out of the chat. Um, there is a suggestion, perhaps think about IPEX or XIAP, mm -hmm. some inflammasomopathies, um, suggestion to check the DHR, mm -hmm. uh, thinking about CGD, potentially card, uh, card 14, another XIAP, uh, DITRA, another X-linked CGD. So we're looking at a lot of inflammatory possibilities here. Um, was there a DHR done at any time? No, unfortunately not. That's definitely a good thought. Um, and uh, a question about herpes virus susceptibility. Um, that was also not done, but definitely a good okay. thought. We really have a lot of differentials. So this is um, so IL ten or IL ten receptor deficiency, um, SAP, Bichette's disease. Uh, a suggestion to look at the CD four CD eight ratio, or um, the, the CD four CD eight ratio is interesting. Which um, PI three K disorders perhaps could be considered. Um, another question, did, did we check other cytokine panels, including ESR? Right, the cytokine panel is actually currently still pending, inclu including the IL-18 level, but that was sent. So a lot of inflammatory differential here, um, and there are a lot of PIDs with the uh, inflammatory bowel disease, so all great suggestions. Right, so very interesting um, differential and all, all great thoughts. So at this point in time, we went ahead um, with obtaining the EBT407, um, and which revealed a mutation in the XIAP gene and intron 5 at a splice site location, um, hemizygous and classified as lightly pathogenic. Another mutation in the NOT2 um, heterozygous was seen and classified as an increased risk allele. So in further explanation, the sequence change um, in the XIAP gene is expected to disrupt RNA splicing and likely result in an absent or disrupted protein product. Um, not to mutation is classified as an increased risk allele, is seen in numerous population-based case control studies as a variant that confers elevated risk of Crohn's disease. At this time, the decision was made to also test his brother, and an VT407 was obtained, which revealed the same mutation in the XIAP gene. Moving on to the discussion section, um, XIAP is X-linked inhibitor for apoptosis, um, which has major domains with notable functions. There are three baculoviral IAP domains, or BRRs which are involved in the protein-protein interactions. XIAP interacts with caspase 3 and 7 and 9 to inhibit apoptosis. There is a UBA domain, which allows XIAP to bind ubiquitin, followed by a C-terminal ring domain, which has E3 ubiquitin ligase function, which allows XIAP to target proteins for proteasomal degradation 
or alter protein function. For example, XIAP ubiquitinates rip K2, which is required for not to mediated activation of NF-kappa B, and lack of XIAP function here may contribute to IBD. So XIAP is involved in multiple cellular signaling pathways, including cell death, inflammation, and cell cycle. And this multifunctionality of XIAP is possible due to the different domains that are present. The main function is anti-apoptotic activity acting on the intrinsic and intrinsic apoptotic pathways. So XIAP also regulates the TNF receptor signal signaling and then NLRP3 inflammasome function. And dysregulation of this pathway can contribute to IBD and development of HLH. So XIAP deficiency was first discovered in 2006. Um, patients with XIAP deficiency are unique compared with patients. Um, which have genetic forms of HLH, which are mostly due to defects in granule-mediated cytotoxicity. There are different phenotypes, um, including high susceptibility to develop HLH in 60% of the patients, recurrent fevers or fevers and cytopenias or light HLH, splenomegaly, IBD in 25 to 30% of the patients, recurrent infections, skin manifestations, and hypogamma globulinemia. Some patients may also develop systemic onset JIA phenotypes and uveitis, but patients do not develop lymphoma. So, so this I'm, is from the original, sorry. I'm just gonna interject here because uh, Rebecca Marsh made a, a great comment, which um, also leads to why the pathogenic mutation or the possible pathogenic mutation in XIAP um, was strongly considered, which is that IPEX path usually is very different from IBD and Crohn's in that IPEX usually has significant villus blunting, which patient had a diagnosis of celiac disease going way back. So um, an important part of the sort of workup and why, why the XIAP uh, mutation was taken very seriously. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is from the original study identifying XIAP in patients who presented with XLP. This is from a cohort of 18 families with an inherited um, disease diagnosed as XLP. 15 um, uh, families um, harbor mutations in the SAP gene. The other three families which failed to detect mutations in the SAP gene. The pedigrees are here as shown. The black boxes re represent the affected individuals and the circles with the black um, points identify the female carriers, and mothers of these patients were found to be asymptomatic heterozygous carriers, and healthy siblings do not carry the mutation in XIAP. So table B is the analyses of the polymorphic markers ma mapped on XQ25 in families one and two. The positive indicates polymorphic markers co-segregates with the condition in the family, while the negative indicates that they do not. Um, so different genes um, contained within the candidate region, as you can see in the gray shading, are listed with their physical positioning. The schematic in C is a representation of the XIAP protein with the intron and exon organization, with the arrows showing the um, sites of the mutations. Um, and D is immunoblotting, which is expression of the inhibitor of apoptosis proteins for patients in the healthy controls, the CTRs. Um, XIAP mutated patients um, and the SAP mutated individuals, the SAPs here. This is from a study in 2011 identifying XIAP variants in male patients with Crohn's disease. This is from a cohort of 96 male patients with pediatric onset Crohn's disease. 4% exhibited mutations in the XIAP gene, and the majority of the XIAP variants identified were associated with a selective defect in NOD1, NOD2 signaling and NOD1, NOD2 mediated activation of NF-kappa B and altered NF-kappa B-dependent cytokine production. So it is important to note that 17% of the patients with XIAP developed IBD symptoms due to variable disease penetrance. Some patients presented with severe treatment refractory intestinal inflammation early in childhood, while others had um, only mild symptoms, which were starting in mid-adulthood. No clinical indicators were identified, uh, which would predict which patients will develop severe IBD manifestations. This is from an important case report, which highlights a constellation of symptoms, including colitis at an early age, severe failure to thrive, and hepatosplenomegaly, which may help identify a subgroup of these patients 
at higher risk of experiencing medically refractory IBD phenotype and increased mortality, um, and hematopoietic stem cell transplantation should be considered early for this subgroup of patients. So XIAP is a variable disease, and transplant may not be indicated in all patients, especially those who present in adulthood or have a milder disease phenotype. The risk-to-benefit ratio assessment for each patient is very important. This is a Kaplan-Meier survival analysis from an international survey done across multiple centers in the United States, in Europe, and Japan, showing the long-term probabilities of survival for patients on um, MAC um, preconditioning regimen, which is uh, myeloablative, and RIC, which is reduced intensity conditioning. And you can see patients who had a reduced intensity conditioning regimen um, achieved remission and had a better survival. So this is a, a reduced intensity conditioning um, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation um, in Japan for XIAP patients. As you can see, there is a 90% survival rate, um, almost even greater than 1,000 days after um, hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So IL-18 levels also normalize um, in patients post-hematopoietic stem cell transplant um, in these studies. And you can see some pictures of improved um, um, colonoscopy um, findings post-hematopoietic stem cell transplant. There's a larger series of uh, reduced intensity um, conditioning and collaboration, uh, which is happening with 40 patients across 10 centers using a variety of reduced intensity conditioning. And the median age of hematopoietic stem cell transplant is around six years uh, for these patients. So, um, with the caveat that in patients um, who develop acute GVHD, the survival drastically drops. So as you can see here, in patients who did not develop um, acute GVHD, the survival was much improved than in patients who developed acute GVHD. So um, this is from a mouse model of the deficiency of XIAP lead leading to increased GVHD. Um, as you can see, the IAPs, um, they inhibit apoptosis, so there is a decreased likelihood of GVHD and improved survival, as opposed to IAPs um, when they are deficient or not functioning appropriately. There is increased apoptosis and increased risk of GVHD, decreasing the survival. So move, coming back to our patient, our patient got admitted for reduced uh, intensity bone marrow transplant from a 10 on 10 matched unrelated donor. Preconditioning with elemtuzumab, fluid arabine, and melphalan was planned. He received four doses of elemtuzumab, but developed a relapse of his HSV and was treated with acyclovir. Hospital course was complicated by copious, loose, watery, osmotic diarrhea and a culture-negative septic shock, and he was transferred to the pediatric ICU on pressors, stressed dose steroids, and broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, he was also noted to be COVID-19 PCR positive. He's currently stable and recovering with hematopoietic stem cell transplantation planned soon. Thank you. Any questions? So, Abir, that was a great presentation, and there are a lot of questions. Um, mm -hmm. And I think uh, Rebecca Marsh can probably help with a lot of the transplant questions. Um, but starting from uh, David Bookbinder had a question on um, whether you could talk a little bit about the options for functional analysis for XIAP variants. Um, are there other assays that are commercially available? Um, what else can be done to when you get a VUS like this to investigate whether that is the actual causal uh, genetic mutation? And yeah, so there are some good options. Um, and, you know, we see some patients that come to us with the USs and, you know, we try to figure out, is it something real or something not? And the two best things, so in addition to protein, and so the protein test is pretty good. It's about 90% sensitive specific, those kind of numbers. So it's not 100%, just like any protein assay. But Medical College of Wisconsin has a very nice functional XIP assay where basically since XIP is involved in NOD2 signaling, you can just stimulate cells with MDP to signal through NOD2 through NF-kappa B and then get 
cytokine readouts. So you can just measure TNF alpha and other cytokines after stimulation. So that's a great functional assay that's up and running and available there. And then also IL-18 levels are useful in these patients because if you have an SIEP patient, typically even when they're well, their IL-18 levels are going to be high. Like typically when I'm seeing patients and they're clinically doing pretty good, you know, they might be sitting at 1,500, 1,200, 1,000, 800, that kind of range. And then when they're very sick, you know, it tends to be a lot, lot higher. And, you know, it can be 40,000, can be 30,000, these kind of numbers. But even when they're well, the IL-18 should be elevated. And so if you have a patient and you're not sure if the IL-18 is totally normal, that would be highly unusual. I've only seen a couple of patients with XIP deficiency who have normal IL-18 levels, and those patients were being treated very aggressively with TNF inhibition. And so, you know, I don't know if this is the answer for that occurring or not, but I think such good blocking of TNF signaling may be responsible for those patients having normal IL-18 levels because you're then, you know, downstream also inhibiting the overactivity of the NLRP3 inflammasome. So functional assay at Medical College of Wisconsin, flow assay, um, and then also IL-18 levels. Great. Well, that, that leads right into the next question, which is what percentage of patients with XIAP defect may have a normal XIAP flow? And is there a utility in testing for the NOD2 signaling in these patients? Do we lose audio? No, I think I just muted myself again. I'm sorry. <laughs> Even though I've been doing this all year, I'm still not like a pro. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's doing the functional things. It's, it's depending what the goal of your testing is. You know, if you have a patient that has a tried and true pathogenic you know, mutation, like maybe they're missing exons five and six or something like this, you know, when you have a patient like that, that has a classic phenotype and a, you know, very serious deleterious type of mutation in their gene, you probably don't need to be doing those things. The IL-18 can be useful for monitoring disease activity, but so can other things, you know, you can be monitoring other biomarkers. Um, so I think it depends on the goal of the testing, you know. Um, and, and there are a number of questions on um, HLH. So um, one was, is recurrent HLH less likely in patients with XIAP deficiency who present mainly with IBD? Um, and there was another one here on HLH in patients with XIAP. Um, oh. Uh, well, I'll answer the first one just because I literally cannot remember two questions in a row. Um, okay. So... The HLH and IBD, I get this question a lot, actually, and we I get it a lot from families and parents um, and patients. And it there, there are, it does tend to be that patients sort of have a class or, you know, constellation of problems with their XIP deficiency. And so IBD patients tend to have really bad IBD. You know, patients who have sort of systemic JIA arthritis, um, uveitis type of phenotypes tend to stay in that family of problems. Patients with HLH and recurrent HLH and cytopenias tend to stay in that family of problems. However, I will say that there are definitely patients with multiple phenotypes. And so just because you have a patient with severe IBD does not mean that they are not going to develop HLH. We definitely also see patients that have IBD and HLH. Um, and it's typically not at the same time, but you know, don't think that just because your patient has had one main problem that that's gonna stay that way over time. Um, this was not the exact question asked, but the NOD2 mutation with L HLH, there is a certain percentage of, HLA, uh, of XIAP patients, sorry, not HLH, but XIAP, XIAP patients that have the NOD2 mutation. And is that an indicator that they're more likely to have the GI disease versus the HLH or just need to be on the lookout? Or will they probably have already presented with the GI disease? Yeah, that's a good question. And I don't know that we have enough patients to really know that, but it certainly makes sense that if you already have a NOD2 variant that predisposes to Crohn's susceptibility, that 
you're going to have a higher likelihood of having Crohn's or, you know, you might ask, does that mean your Crohn's is going to be more severe, this type of thing? Um, I don't know. You know, you might, you know, I also propose that since XIP deficiency prohibits any signaling of NOD2, then maybe it doesn't matter. So I actually, I don't know the answer to that. It's a great question. Um. And so uh, there's also a question about transplant and uh, using carrier sibs or, um, you know, uh, female uh, carriers in terms of transplant. Yeah, so this is a really good question and an important one. And I will preface it by saying that I am very much a pro-use carriers in many settings, but XIP deficiency is not one of them because there are a significant number of female carriers of XIP deficiency who have IBD. And it tends to be in patients that have skewing um, of their X chromosome and activation. And so in this disease, I tend to not use a carrier or a haploidentical you know, mother for that reason. There's also two patients, and there may be three, I can't remember, there's at least two, there may be three patients published that have developed HLH um, because they had severe skewing. We had a patient here at Children's, Mike Jordan had a female patient and we only picked her up, you know, cause we sent the big panel, you know, um, and it happened to show that she had an XIEP pathogenic variant. And when we did her flow, you know, she had only four or 5% of cells that were positive for XIEP. So this is one disease where it, it's really better to go with an unrelated donor. So like CGD, the mosaicism may be problematic. Yeah. Carriers. Got it. Although I don't know. I still use carriers in CGD just because I'm I'm not sure. It's a very real theoretical concern. I'm just not sure how much data we have to support it yet. And it's just graft versus host disease is bad. And so I still tend to actually be okay with using a carrier in CGD, but I fully recognize that there are, you know, physicians who are not XIP, I'm I'm definitely not on that. Okay. And um, a great question from Dr. Pramal, who originally diagnosed this patient and follows his brother, which is, uh, she would love to hear your thoughts on how to manage the brother who has the same genetic mutation, but is stable. Transplant or wait and see approach? And hi, everyone. So we, hi, Rebecca, I'm, I'm online too. So if you have any questions, I can give you a little more information on the brother. Yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the brother. <laughs> Right. So, so the brother came to me really for an allergy workup uh, because in the DR had a lot of allergy symptoms. And so, of course, I did skin testing and was positive to many environmental allergens, has a shellfish allergy um, and what I thought was asthma. But then as we get more of the story from mom, sounds like the child also had recurrent pneumonias um, and was hospitalized a few times. Uh, last being at 11 years of age, he's now 14. And, you know, week long admissions treated with antibiotics, um, no other types of infections that I could get from the mom. Um, and is well appearing. I mean, he's been doing well overall. I was a little concerned about his uh, spirometry. Uh, there was no uh, albuterol reversibility, but definitely obstructive. And so I did a CT chest CT and chest x-ray and everything looks normal, no bronchiectasis or fibrosis. Um, I did a little bit, I've started a little bit of immune workup. Everything looks good so far. Uh, immunoglobulins look good. Vaccine titers look good. Uh, TNB cell subsets look good. And so I don't know, you know, long-term plan for him, what would be the best thing to do? Yeah, I probably wouldn't transplant this patient. You know, we, there are a lot of XIP deficient patients that we don't transplant. And it, it's the same in other um, you know, kind of HLH specialty sort of centers that are seeing a higher proportion of these patients, just because there are some patients that do, they just do remarkably well, like for, you know, years and years, and they have some minor problems pop up from time to time, or, you know, maybe one or two significant problems. And then there's patients like this that seem to be having some problems, but now that you know the diagnosis and can be, you know, aggressive about treating infections and watching for HLH and um, looking for just other milder inflammatory problems, like I wouldn't recommend transplant for someone like this. I usually, so XIP deficient transplant outcomes, you know, they're probably 70 to 80% survival for all comers, which sounds good. You know, remember that means that 20 to 30% of the patients are going to have a bad outcome. And that's that's a really significant risk. 
And so I'm usually only transplanting for patients that have, you know, failed five, six, seven therapies for whatever their primary problems are. And for others who are doing relatively well, you know, we're trying just to support them and keep them healthy. Okay, great. So I probably, I wouldn't transplant that patient. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, I want to thank everyone, including uh, Dr. Marsh, Dr. Siddiqui, Dr. Pramal, um, and we're going to move on to the next case. Um, so the next case is a case of cytopenias with splenomegaly and lymphoproliferation, and it's going to be presented by Nikita Rajay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be presenting the second case. Uh, I'm Nikita Rajay. I'm from Children's Mercy, Kansas City. And Dr. Kaneti Rao has graciously agreed to be my senior mentor. So let's get started. So as you just heard, this is a case of cytopenias, um, splenomegaly, and lymphoproliferation. So again, another 16-year-old. Uh, our patient is a 16-year-old girl uh, who was uh, unvaccinated through her, throughout her childhood. This is the timeline of her infections. So she had hand, foot, mouth disease, several strep and staph skin infections at bug bite sites. Um, she had multiple ear and sinus infections, uh, warts. At 10-year age, she had chickenpox. She had uh, gingivitis and nose and mouth sores that started around 15 years of age. Um, then she had E. coli UTI and had pneumonia twice, at one at three-year age and then 16-year age. Most of these infections were initially just thought to be infections of normal childhood or uh, just because of her unvaccinated st status. At 16 year age, she then presented to an outside hospital with fatigue and dizziness that was going on for six months and was noted to have anemia and severe neutropenia. Her, she, uh, she had IV uh, iron infusion at that point, and then uh, she continued to have anemia as they continued to, hematology at the outside hospital continued to watch her. She had a bone marrow aspiration done, which was found to have hypercellular bone marrow with less granulocytes and atypical T-cell proliferation, but no evidence of lymphoma. At that point, she was uh, sent to hematology at our hospital and was seen in the clinic where she had further workup. She was noted to have splenomegaly. Intermittent thrombocytopenia was noted over the previous six months. Uh, and then the workup showed antiplatelet antibodies and Coombs test was positive. All right, so um, I'll go ahead and um, uh, talk about the rest of the history here. I do see that there is another question of whether there were double negative T cells and uh, definitely a great question and we'll come to that as well. So uh, for the rest of the history, her uh, she had difficulty gaining height throughout her childhood. Uh, developmental delay was noted, so gross motor deficits. She had learning difficulties and low IQ and had some features of autism. So she was high functioning, but had some autistic features. She was born uh, at 36 weeks and five days gestation and was thought to be low birth weight. Uh, she had mild eczema. Uh, the only procedure that she had had was uh, the bone marrow biopsy that just we just saw. Um, again, as I mentioned, this family dis did not believe in vaccines and she was uh, unvaccinated throughout her childhood and had several infections. Um, family history, there was no known immunodeficiency in the family. Sister had short stature and one of the brothers had multiple infections, um, but nothing as severe as uh, she had. She lived with her parents and seven siblings um, and had some pets, no significant social history there. On exam, she had short stature, uh, normal weight, slow cognition. Uh, she wore glasses. She had splenomegaly and mild eczematous rash. Rest of the exam was uh, normal. All right. So, um, 
let's go ahead and see what uh, what we can come up for differential diagnosis. I do see one comment with the double negative uh, T cell question. So go ahead, tell me a few more uh, differential that we are talking about. Okay. Get a two Alps. Alps or Alps-like syndromes. I'm seeing STAT3 gain of function, PI3KCD, again, APDS. WIMP syndrome, OK. LRBA and CTLA4. Okay, so that was that's a good start. A lot of um, differential here, uh, seeing some diseases of immune dysregulation, some other combined immunodeficiencies um, based on the type of infections that we are seeing, some of the um, other autoimmune features that we are seeing. So let's so um, so let's get uh, going with the rest of the case here. So uh, our hematology clinic as well thought about ALPS or ALPS-like syndrome, and they started the initial workup. Here's the uh, here's some of the lab data. So her CBC with differential showed um, anemia. Uh, at that point, she was her hemoglobin was at 9.4 with low hematocrit, increased retic count, and RDW and her neutrophil count was uh, pretty low at 90. Now, her hemoglobin, when she was she presented at the outside hospital and needed IV or was given IV iron was 6.6. Um, at this point, when she was seen by our hematology, she got flow cytometry done, which showed um, low CD4 count with 7% uh, CD3 cells being CD4 positive and 91% of those were CD8 positive. She had no B cells and then K cells at that point were normal. She had the ALPS panel done that did not show, uh, that was not suggestive of ALPS, so had 0.5% TCR alpha beta uh, double negative T cells, so was not suggestive of ALPS. Ultrasound abdomen confirmed uh, uh, splenomegaly. We were still not convinced that this was not ALPS or ALPS-like, so she had the ALPS gene panel sent. At the same time, she was started on GCSF, and preventive antibiotics were given. Around that time, her uh, with the GCSF, her neutrophil count started improving, uh, Her but she continued to have infections, and she developed this chronic cough and was thought to have this chronic pneumonia. She had a CT chest done that showed bronchiectasis and a BAL done that showed strep pneumo and was found to have a penicillium species mold that was further uh, identified as gliomastix polychroma. This was around 17 year age. And be because of these results, um, because of these results, she was sent to immunology clinic at this point. Um, so, um, uh, I see a question in the chat here. Did we miss on the immunoglobulin profile? And no, I have not shown that. But next slide, we'll be talking about the labs from immunology. So this is the point where we actually, um, we saw the patient in our clinic. And based on the immune workup or more for the clinical peak picture, uh, we started her on immunoglobulin infusions. More testing was sent. La immune workup was sent. And she got cough assist therapy. So let's move on and talk about the lab values. So she, her IgG level was normal. Her IgM was um, normal and IgA was high. Her IgD level was a little bit elevated. She had autoimmune workup done because of her um, um, cytopenias and uh, all the workup had was negative except for uh, her Coombs test being positive, antiplatelet antibodies and thyroid peroxidase antibodies. Um, I do see another question here, anti-neutrophil antibodies. The anti-neutrophil antibodies were done, but that test was negative. T-cell clonality, and I'll show you the results in, a, in just a minute here. 
And for further workup of the antibody uh, deficiency, um, we did isohemagglutinin titers because she was unvaccinated and it was positive. But she had several infections through her childhood. So we thought we can uh, check her pneumococcal titers to see if she had made antibodies to the natural infections. And she had made response to six out of 23 uh, serotypes. Uh, including one of the po pure polysaccharide uh, serotype. She also had uh, positive antibodies to varicella zoster. So based on these results, she really did not qualify for immunoglobulin infusions, but at that point, her uh, she, ha she had not responded to prophylactic antibiotics. Uh, she had infections, zero, zero B cells, and so we go went ahead and started her infusions. Here is her flow cytometry. So this was the repeat flow cytometry that continues to show that pattern of higher CD8 count compared to CD4, low B cells, and she had uh, low um, naive CD4 and CD8 counts. Her lymphocyte proliferation to mitogens was normal. This is, these are the results for Ambal. Uh, uh, apart from the um, strep pneumo and the gliomastic polychroma, she had uh, EBV and HHV6 in her uh, BAL as well. Uh, her sweat chloride test and oxidative burst test were negative. Uh, her uh, BCR-TCR rearrangement uh, studies did show a clonal rearrangement. So I'm going to stop here to see more comments here. Uh, were there T-Regs done, uh, studies done? And the T-Reg study was done, and I'll show them to you in a few minutes here. Uh, PI3KCD is another likely uh, possibility, and um, one of the question is, uh, are these LGLs? And um, so again, we'll come back to that. So the genetic testing came back. Some of the some of it came back. So the microarray results were normal. Um, the primary immunodeficiency panel that was sent showed a couple of um, findings. One of them was CARD11 variant that was a synonymous variant of unknown significance, and so we did not think it uh, was significant. There was a TASI variant which was. Uh, called likely pathogenic. This was a single variant. And again, this we had a discussion with uh, NIH. And again, this wasn't thought to be the cause of all the symptoms that she was having. Her whole exome sequencing was actually done at NIH. And they found this caspase 14 variant that was not previously described. And that was one of the thought that could this be the diagnosis. However, after their evaluation, the thought was that this particular variant, uh, it was it was not possible to verify the uh, cause and um, the results remained inconclusive. So we still didn't have a diagnosis. Um, so uh, any other thoughts? I see one more here, ADA2. Anything else that you guys would like to add to the discussion? Somatic uh, fast mutation. Some actinopathies related PID. Okay. All right. Stat three gain of function. All right, let's move on. So we'll find out in a few minutes. So here are more imaging studies. Um, so we uh, we did talk about the CT chest showing bronchiectasis. She had an MRI brain for her growth and developmental issues, and that showed uh, corpus callosum dysgenesis and some dilatation of uh, ventricles. And she also had opacification of one of her sinuses. And then the bone survey was done for her short stature that showed spinoepifacial dysplasia. So the spine showed mild end plate irregularity. Uh, there was um, abnormalities of uh, in her hands and feet with bracte brachydactyly uh, that was suggestive of spinoepifacial dysplasia. And then we had these studies done uh, that might be a clue to one more um, question of what we found on further genetic testing. This is the BAF expression of this uh, few B cells that we found. It showed mildly decreased relative frequency of BAF receptor positive CD19 positive B cells. Um, 
test. Here is the testing for the FOXP3 and Tregs. It did show some decreased percentage of Tregs with normal FOXP3 expression, decreased absolute number of Tregs and FOXP3 expressing Tregs, uh, but normal percentage of FOXP3 um, Tregs, so 79%. All right, I do see that there are a couple of more, or maybe one more. TLR8 variant is another suggestion. Um, DIK3R1 is another possibility that has been mentioned. Any other thoughts? NF kappa B. Okay. Well, so I think, you know, some of these cases are really um, complex. And as we go through the differential, some of sometimes we just have to get that genetic test result to find out what we what the patient has. Um, and so um, let me go ahead and show you the results. So the further testing was done for with home, uh, sorry, whole genome sequencing. And we found this uh, these two variants in RNU4ATAC gene. Uh, so these uh, variants were suggestive of um, uh, Reufman syndrome. So she had co compound heterozygous variants for Reufman syndrome. Um, so hold on to those thoughts and let's see if that even explains uh, whether uh, all her symptoms and signs that we looked at could be explained by these, uh, this finding. So let's talk a little bit about Reufman syndrome. So this, uh, it's a non-coding gene, that's correct. Um, and so uh, it's a non-coding gene encoding small nuclear RNA. U4ATAC is a small nuclear RNA that helps in removal of U12 type interons. And this disorder presents with spinoepiphyseal dysplasia, growth retardation, cognitive delay, immunodeficiency, retinal dysplasia, autoimmunity, and brain abnormalities, specifically corpus callosum agenesis. BAF-dependent survival of transitional B cells depends on MAP kinase 1 signaling, and defective minor splicing in that MAP K1, particularly in B cells, leads to defective survival at transitional B cell stage and differentiation into naive mature B cell stage. Defective megakaryocyte differentiation leads to thrombocytopenia, and defective splicing of these two genes can lead to abnormal platelet granule formation, so DIAPH1 and HPS. Here's further information on Reifman syndrome. So the first figure here up here shows how uh, the maturation is arrested at transitional B cell stage, and there is decreased BAF receptor expression and increased serum BAF level. Here, this is the gene for that non-coding, uh, non-coding, uh, sorry, for the RNA, um, small nuclear RNA. And here are the two variants that our patient had, eight at uh, position or locus eight and 37. Um, but there are for several more variants that can cause this disorder in this gene. And some of these uh, variants can cause something called MOPD type one or microcephalic osteodysplastic primordial dwarfism that does not include immunodeficiency. Whereas Reufman syndrome has some, dif some uh, features that vary a little bit and that includes immunodeficiency. All right, so the story really doesn't end here. And give me one minute and I'll come back to your questions in the chat here. Um, so really, you know, we we thought she was doing a little bit better with this therapy on immunoglobulin infusions and cough assist therapy. Um, so we continue to watch her with those results of Reufman syndrome. Uh, we talked to Dr. Reufman in um, a sick, uh, sick Kids Ontario and um, uh, their cohort really doesn't have the T-cell proliferation that we saw in our patient. Um, so 
even though some of the features that I mentioned could be explained in our patient, the severe neutropenia or the T-cell proliferation was uh, really stood out in our patient. Uh, at 19 year age, she had worsening T-cell proliferation when we did a flow site, just a routine monitoring flow cytometry in follow-up. And she had a CD8 count of 17,000, more than 17,000 at this point. So this figure here basically shows the same findings. So all along, she had low neutrophils, uh, low hemoglobin and platelets. But at some point, her white count and absolute lymphocyte count just took off um, and really went really up. Um, here's her flow cytometry. The first flow cytometry you see, saw, sorry, are looking at is the one that we saw before. And here is the one at 19 year age where she had 99% of her uh, CD, uh, of the lymphocytes were CD3, no B or NK cells, and most of these cells were CD8. So I did see um, that um, someone commented, and here's our uh, diagnosis for an explanation for that T-cell proliferation. So repeat bone marrow biopsy was sent. Uh, it showed hypercellular bone marrow with moderate reticulin fibrosis, trilineage hematopoiesis with nucle uh, neutrophilic hypoplasia, and frequent phenotypically atypical CD8 positive T cells. And further workup showed a somatic STAT3 variant, an mTOR amplification, along with intrasinusoidal infiltration pattern that was suggestive of T cell large LGL. So I do see that some of you uh, you had mentioned LGL and STAT3 variant. Um, so that was uh, the finding we had. Here is uh, the... Uh, some of these findings. So the first figure that you're looking at is peripheral blood with atypical lymphocytes. Um, here in panel B, you're seeing the bone marrow with atypical lymphocytes. Panel C, D, and E are showing uh, lymphocytes, medium-sized lymphocytes that are um, CD3 positive and CD8 positive. And you can see the reticulin fibrosis in panel F. Here's the flow cytometry that showed a CD8 positive population here in dark purple. Uh, that was that showed decreased expression of CD7 and absent uh, expression of uh, CD5. Um, all right, so. So the, we, so this patient had STAT3 somatic variant mutation uh, that was uh, responsible for that T-cell uh, T LGL. Uh, so here's just some more information on uh, that condition. Um, there is a study that, that showed a cohort of 77 patients with STAT3 variants in LGL and 40% of, sorry, so all T-cell LGLs and out of those 40% had STAT3 somatic variants in CD8 positive T-cell. Cells. Out of these, 9% of the patients had the variant that our patient had, D666, sorry, 661Y, and then the rest had other variants in the same gene. All these mutations are in the SH2 domain, leading to dimerization and activation and phosphorylation of STAT3 protein. So that was so we found two immune defects in our patient. First one that explained some of the uh, symptoms and signs that we saw. Uh, so some of the growth and developmental issues uh, could be explained. Uh, however, uh, even the low B cells could be explained by that, but how the neutrophil count and the T cell proliferation was not explained by Reifman syndrome. Um, but then we found this somatic STAT3 variant that was responsible for T cell LGL in our patient. So that's correct. So I'm going to go back to the chat uh, here um, to see if I can answer more questions. And I would like to have Dr. Rao join me to uh, help me here as well. Um, so yeah, so I'm looking at these um, questions here. Uh, the Reifman syndrome gene, it's a non-coding gene. Um, there's another question asking, do you think mom was also affected? I think she had short stature, but not sure about other clinical features wouldn't fit for autosomal recessive inheritance. So mom did not, uh, it, uh, it was the sister who had short stature and then brother who had infections. And so we brought them back for further evaluation uh, to see if they had that those variants. And they so out of the seven siblings, two of those siblings had 
uh, these variants. Um, mom had suspected that for the sister because she said she looked like her she was short stature she didn't have as many infections um, but she just worried that she might have the same disease so she was found to have the two variants and then brother who had infections also had the two variants however they uh, were none of them were as severe as she had she was the next question here is where did you uh, send the whole, ex uh, whole, sorry, whole genome sequencing? So we have a genome center at our hospital uh, who have a research protocol and they basically um, do genetic workup on research basis and will continue to do that till they find answers, not just for immunodeficiencies, but any disorders. So it was done at our hospital. STAT3 variant, was it somatic? Yes, it was somatic. What's the reported VAF for STAT3? So this testing was done on bone marrow, and I do not know if I have the um, VAF on that STAT3. Was this, so sorry, I don't have that answer. Um, I can take a look to see if there is a way to find that. Uh, Megan Cooper, sorry, there's another question. Was the STAT3 variant present only in LGL cells or was she mosaic from the start and then developed this? Um, so that's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. We didn't find it on the, on the um, genome or we didn't find this variant in the blood. However, um, as you mentioned, could she be mosaic from the start? And even when she, before she presented to our hospital, she has had that T cell proliferation in her bone marrow, even mm -hmm. though uh, her flow cytometry was normal to begin with. So, um, so that's still a possibility. And Dr. Rao, I was wondering if you had any other thoughts. No, my I, I'm just here a figurehead so that all those people who are guessing the differential diagnosis, they're thrown off the scent of the real disease that we are dealing with. <laughs> so I, I think the more important uh, message here is uh, if you don't have your answers and you are not happy with what you are seeing, you have to keep looking and Genetic testing does not end with one genetic testing report. When you see patients' clinical phenotype is changing, you have to repeat. And uh, there is, I think, uh, this somatic variant uh, pushing the patient's clinical finding in one direction or the other. We will keep seeing these more and more. So well, there was a time when we used to have a genetic diagnosis at age, 20, age 2 or 10, and then the patient will be fine for the rest of their life with that carrying that genetic diagnosis of CGD or whatever. Uh, but I think we are in a stage now where uh, patients will, a substantial number of patients with primary immunodeficiency carry more than one genetic disease and it's a matter of time that we understand and learn and look for it. And I think somatic and germline combination, I think Ruluka and that crowd has already commented about it in uh, from Europe. So we will see more and more of this kind of presentation. That's all I can say at this point. You have done a very good call cogent presentation, so nothing more for me to add. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rao. I think there are a couple of more questions. Um, so how are you treating the patient? Are you or hematology going to treat that T-cell LGL? So um, I would definitely like my hematology colleagues to help me with that uh, treatment. Uh, so T-cell LGL is typically an adult uh, on onset disease and is less likely to be seen in younger kids. Uh, but there is there are some cohorts mentioned in literature uh, where they present in adolescence. So we decided to, or our hematology uh, colleagues in our hospital decided to take help from adult hematologists uh, in the area. And so she uh, she was seen there and was uh, given some options. One of the treatment that was suggested was starting methotrexate. And then um, I think they were discussing other options when family has decided to take a second opinion from a national expert in T-cell LGL. Uh, so we are waiting. So she hasn't been treated. This is a pretty uh, new finding over the last few months. Uh, so we are still kind of deciding on the treatment. Uh, who do you, another question, who did you guys, Sorry, used to pick up 
the somatic variant in house as well no so that's correct so we sent the the, the bone marrow biopsy to initially to nih initial thought was that she did not have a malignancy and then uh, again you know again we just did not have that answer so it was sent again to one more place a uh, foundation one that's where that somatic variant was um, detected um next uh, comment here you can look at the same variant in the targeted ngs panel because coverage will be greater although at lower frequency that's a good thought thank you um maybe use jack inhibitor 2 for lgl thank you for that um, uh, suggestion um all right and in peripheral blood for mosaicism so definitely we have some more work to do um and hopefully we are able to give uh, some more um, you know uh, the appropriate therapy for lgl to this patient any other comments or questions sorry i'm a little over time here but um i really enjoyed all the questions and comments um so thank you everyone um any other questions all right Thank you all for joining today, and we'll see you back in September.